Good evening and welcome to the January 9th, 2017 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Karen, could you please call the roll? Mr. DuPerry? Here. Mrs. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bailey? Here. Ms. Auglis? Thank you. Uh, let the record show that in the absence of Ms. Auglis, uh, Ms. Hendrickson, uh, as the first alternate, will be a voting member this evening should we have a vote on anything. Uh, and also I understand that Ms. Saunders is, is running a little bit late, but she will be joining us. Uh, before moving on to approval of minutes from the last meeting, uh, we do have a little bit of housekeeping to do here uh, with this being the first meeting of the new calendar year. Um, I would like to move to amend the agenda to add the election of officers for the calendar year of 2017. So moved. Second. We have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. And I will turn it over to our acting secretary. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to uh, place and uh, re actually renominate. I'm going to do, do two items. Uh, first one would be to renominate Corey Fellows as the chair. Well, I guess I can't do it myself. Can, can I? Yeah. Renominate myself as, uh, as the secretary. I'll second, I guess. <laughs> I second both? And he, yep. he can't second. Uh, I'll not, I'm a second alternate. We'll be a voting member because this isn't a, this oh, is right. a board procedural oh, item okay. where we can check. actually yes. vote on yes. this. Okay. 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 Or, or, uh, Are you nominating or making a motion? You second a motion and a nomination just stands on this face. And we vote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what's happening? Are you making a motion to elect yeah. chair? Yeah, motion. Okay. Yeah. I'll, so I'll second the motion. Uh, all in favor of that motion. Okay, my second right. motion is to uh, nominate um, Nick McGee as the vice chair. Second. Any discussion? All in favor. Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to business. Now we're going to fix the world. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was the hard part. <laughs> uh, next item is approval of minutes from the December 12th, 2016 meeting. Um, I just need a quick clarification on all motion to approve. Um, can we just verify that Ms. Saunders was opposed and not abstaining? I, I thought my recollection there was an abstention, not necessarily an opposition. I clarified that whether she was opposing it. Okay, thank you. Because I, I thought she was abstaining too, but I did ask her okay, before I went downstairs. So. And I'll motion to approve the minutes. Great. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Our next item, Rainin Properties LLC and Dunstan Properties LLC request the fifth amended subdivision plan review for Dunstan Crossing subdivision. Jay? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you noted, this is an application for the fifth amended subdivision of Dunstan Crossing. Board members will recall in one of our uh, final meetings, I think it was in November of last year, we, um, the board approved the fourth amended subdivision. So we've been reviewing um, pieces and parts of this project along the way. Um, so the fifth amended subdivision really has sort of three critical components. You'll, you will have received uh, staff comments um, as well as comments from peer reviewers, Bill Bray and looking at traffic and water current, looking at civil engineering issues. Um, so, so Dunstan Crossing, um, as I said, there's sort of three main elements that I think we're really looking for the board to weigh in on. I think as our memo, staff memo indicated, there's a host of details that still need to be fleshed out um, in terms of plan coordination be sure that all the details are sort of where they need to be prior to moving forward. However, as I said, uh, uh, so with that, I'm going to sort of focus on 
sort of high-level elements, and certainly if there are any details board members want to talk about or the applicant has questions about, now would be a good time to talk about those. Otherwise, like I said, I'll sort of focus at the high level and be prepared to talk about anything else. Um, I guess the first one I just want to sort of introduce and be sure we talk about is an understanding that um, the applicant, the original approval for, for Dunstan Crossing included sort of the 142 residential units, if you will. Uh, no, 142 acres, I'm sorry, uh, through phases one through six, which are really sort of the, the color, um, color areas shown on the plan actually on the poster board up there and what we have up on the screen. As part of that, the applicant got approval um, through a density bonus for affordable housing. The original approval sort of called for some of those affordable housing units to be sprinkled throughout the various phases. Um, but as this board has been familiar with through discussions with this applicant as well as uh, other applicants, Eastern Village being among those, um, the affordable housing components have been difficult to um, to bring to bear. And so the applicant has actually had a discussion within the last two months or so, or at least the applicant's representative with the Housing Alliance to look at ways of um, addressing the, the affordable housing uh, uh, provisions by establishing the units within a multiplex building, a uh, multifamily building, which would be in phase six. So that's the purple uh, properties shown on the, on the poster board. As I said, the applicant, my understanding, I wasn't at the meeting, but based on what I was, um, uh, the feedback I received from Tom Hall, the town manager, the alliance was generally in favor of that approach or okay with that approach. Certainly there's some details to be worked out, but again, felt that it was important for the board to understand what discussions have gone on, sort of the modifications from board's prior conditions of approval that are being sought, and just to be sure that the board uh, understands those and, and also weighs in if you're generally favorable or if there's other issues we need to be looking at. Um, the other sort of element I want to mention, a large part of why this subdivision amendment is coming before you is really focused in on sort of the two, uh, what, we're, what are referred to as commercial lots or otherwise known in the application as Dunstan Village. These are the lots we've been looking at through the summer and fall sort of as the plan development process culminating in the approved master plan which called for a certain amount of mixed uses, um, the, the recently approved restaurant, the now uh, more specifically proposed uh, housing units that we'll be looking at with the next application. So part <coughs> of this uh, subdivision amendment brings in the net the allowed uh, density uh, residential units into the full set in um, and also starts to trigger some amendments and, and changes to their state and federal permits in terms of DEP, DOT, uh, potentially Army Corps. So it would be helpful, uh, again, have the applicant maybe just touch on where those stand and what, where, um, what modifications are being looked at with those. And that really brings to the third and final item that I want to make sure the board is really um, looking at, again, sort of keeping at the, at the bigger picture here, are the off-site improvements, more specifically the left-hand turn lane on Route 1, which is really being, part, which is, uh, being uh, uh, required due to the additional traffic that's being proposed with the approval of the two commercial lots and, and the proposed activities. Um, I think the main element here that uh, staff wants to be sure the board and applicant sort of talk about and um, really has to do with ensuring that that left-hand turn lane, the design, functions as a, uh, a transition area. Um, this is a, uh, I'm sure board members are, are familiar, this is a, a really a transit, um, what we'd like to see this become is a transitional zone as folks are coming out of Saco at generally traveling at highway speeds and coming into the Dunstan area of town that folks recognize they're coming somewhere different. So what the treatment of that Route 1 left-hand turn, particularly sort of the pockets, and right now the applicant's proposing some striping. Uh, maybe there's something, um, some other elements that could really uh, be utilized to um, uh, ensure this area is identified more as a transition zone. I think some of that's spelled out in Mr. Bray, Bill Bray's uh, memo as well as staff's memo. I think that those are details that the board 
thinks that that's also a good idea that staff could continue to work with the applicant on um, in the coming weeks. Um, so with that, as I said, we also have a host of sort of more detailed I items in our in our comments, but for now I think I'll sort of leave it at that. And as always, Angela's here to answer any questions we might have for her as well. So with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. And I will hand it over to the applicant's team. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And members of the board, my name is Sean Frank. I'm a civil engineer with Sebago Technics. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Elliot Chamberlain, uh, the applicant, and, uh, and Mark Barnes, the, uh, the architect from uh, Foresight uh, Architects, LLC. Uh, obviously, the board's somewhat familiar with this project. We've been, uh, obviously, uh, here numerous times. Uh, as Jay stated, the real point associated with this was the fact that we had had the fourth amended subdivision, which basically allowed us to have uh, three phases of development um, rather than, uh, excuse me, six phases of development rather than the previously approved four. Uh, this is kind of refining that fourth phase of development, if you will, as well as the development of the commercial lots. And there we go. And with that, I'll just, uh, just I'll try to be as brief as I can. As Jay stated, basically uh, uh, the blue is the area we're talking about specifically, which is the phase four from the Dunstan Cross and subdivision, as well as the two commercial lots up in this area. So as part of this, basically we'll be extending from the uh, existing terminus uh, and constructing uh, Walton Drive up to this location here, and then Stewart Drive uh, all the way back up to Route 1 uh, within that redefined right of way we talked about as part of that last phase. In association with that, we actually have four stormwater detention basins proposed, which will basically handle this whole phase of development of this whole side of the development. If you will. Uh, we have a pond in this area right here, uh, another one that's down here. Uh, as you know, remember this is double strip, sparsed in through here, coming off from the uh, end of Phoenix Drive. Uh, so that kind of separates it, if you will. So we have a treatment pond in this location and two on either side uh, of Stewart Drive on this side of the Brook. Association uh, with development of commercial lots. Uh, obviously, we're dealing a lot uh, with the town engineer as well as the main department of environmental protection in terms of uh, redesigning those ponds to assure that they are meeting today's guidelines in terms of Chapter 500. Uh, as we discussed, we have now uh, a box helper proposed here at the Philip Crossing. Uh, so, one part of this whole submission work is basically all the construction problems associated with. Uh, the proposed work we're talking about here, which is the planning profile, the utilities and planning profile uh, associated with this phase four development. Uh, just to reiterate, the phase four will actually include uh, uh, 11 duplex units, uh, again, as shown in the building of single family house lots. So there's actually 34 residential units associated with phase four in the Crossing Crossing Subs subdivision, which will be along uh, this section of, uh, of the sewer project. This is the area in purple right here uh, that Jay had referenced in terms of the affordable housing component uh, that Mr. Chamberlain uh, discussed with the, uh, the Housing Alliance. As we, and I'm sure the board has heard numerous times, you know, the initial intent, if you did then, was to kind of spread those units out uh, within the development. Uh, it just doesn't seem to work out from an economic standpoint, so instead what you'd be proposing is to actually construct those units, uh, those 10 units, if you will, uh, within this area. And that's to the rear of the commercial, and this is that uh, open field area after everything's all set and done, so across the building. As Jay stated, as part of this also uh, is the actual subdivision, if you will, the amended subdivision to allow for the development of these lots, and again, specifically the residential component of, of, these, of these two commercial lots that's through here. Uh, specifically, and what we'll be talking about after this is the site plan approval associated with the four townhouse units as well as the apartment building uh, within here. So basically this subdivision plan, if you will, for those uh, lots is basically uh, taking the, the approved master plan, if you will, and just kind of cleaning that up uh, from a, a striping uh, building locations and all those things that we had discussed in association with the gate uh, and the path that we uh, the other part of this discussion had included uh, a proposed left turn lane. Um, and it's, again, it's the plan as part of the package, if you will, that we have there. Uh, the intent basically is to, right now we have two lanes in both directions on this section of Route 1. Uh, the intent is to basically uh, create an island in Sophia to provide uh, a left turn pocket 
uh, turned into the proposed project. Uh, at the same time, what that will offset is a, another pocket on this side, uh, which will allow people that are coming in the sublet, not to be collection, coming off from here, actually a, a little refuge area if you look to be able to pull out and then pull back into the traffic. Uh, this is the concept plan we forwarded to DOT along with our latest uh, traffic movement permit as statistics. Uh, basically, we get them to approve this and then issue a TMP associated with that. Uh, as you may recall, what we had was some approved trips in association with uh, the residential development of Dunstan. Uh, what we were asking was to utilize those trips, if you will, uh, for the proposed uh, restaurant and the residential component of, uh, of Dunstan Village. Uh, with the full understanding that prior to the start of Phase 5, prior to any more development within through here, that this will be fully designed and actually uh, uh, approved by the DOT so that will be in construction and association with any further development that's out through here. Um, uh, also as part of that uh, overall subdivision, you may recall we had a, um, a pump station design, all of the sewer from this development as well as that whole side. Again, has been designed in this part of the uh, package we have submitted. Uh, so the sanitary district has, uh, has their design plans. I've met with the water district, hopefully for the final time, uh, uh, to work out any little conflicts associated with the, uh, the water infrastructure design. Uh, I talked to the DEP review engineer this morning. He's supposed to wrap up his review for me tomorrow uh, so that we can start writing that permit. And like I said, the traffic movement permit uh, through the main DOT, uh, uh, we're just waiting them to basically uh, sign off on it and to prepare the written permit associated with that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we do understand we've received the review comments, obviously, from our town staff. Uh, they've graciously agreed to meet with us again over the next couple of days uh, so we can get together and hopefully uh, uh, clean up a lot of the details associated with this. As you can imagine, I think I have details on one set of drawings for site plans that you know maybe are more appropriate for a subdivision and maybe have some uh, information on one set of plans that should be on the other. So again, we certainly appreciate their time and uh, our intention is to meet with them uh, uh, this week uh, to review that and in the meantime, certainly I'll be working on that. Uh, but certainly uh, as the uh, information that uh, uh, Mr. Chase had brought up was and regarding the, uh, uh, the stormwater management associated with this, uh, the subdivision itself, if you will, of the, uh, of the, uh, the Dunstan Village, uh, the proposed left turn lane, and kind of the, uh, the status of the permit. So uh, we basically wanted to introduce that to you. Obviously, when I made my initial submission December 12th, we were hoping you know, we were a little further along. Uh, but again, I think that we can certainly pull this together relatively quickly with, uh, with staff's help and assistance and uh, our intent is to be back here and you know in a very short time frame to try to wrap this up so uh with that mr chairman i would conclude my presentation and certainly be happy to answer any questions the board may have regarding the subdivision thank you very much thank you is anyone else from your team you want to talk about the subdivision okay. this isn't relative this is just yeah. okay uh, no actually but so you're there'll be more the for the actual site plan okay. process all right thanks thank you mr chairman uh would you have the opportunity for public comment on this item if anyone's interested, seeing none, we'll turn to the board and uh, we'll start down here with you, Roger. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um. I'm sorry. All right, back on the hot seat. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> My apologies. All right, that's all right. Uh, just for clarification, um, as I understand it, the work on Route 1 that won't have to be done until lot one is developed or does it have to be done before then? That would happen. That this work on phase one, uh, excuse me, on route one, wouldn't have to happen until either uh, we start one of these other phases, the blue phase or the purple phase, phase five or six within the Dunstan, within the Dunstan crossing subdivision, 
or if we came back in for any other site plans associated with uh, the Dunson Village subject. Meaning lot one, though, right? No, any site within the, lot one. The yeah. restaurant. The, yeah. So, if if I might, if, if board members may remember when we approved the restaurant again uh, back in November, one of the conditions of approval was that um, that they can't start any other development of phases five or six, as uh, Mr. Frank just pointed out, or any other parts of of these two commercial lots. Now with the submission, the detailed submission of the residential components, buildings H1 through H5, the applicant has demonstrated that they actually have capacity through what was approved for phases five and six to build both the restaurant and the residential components without going over that trip, those allowed trips, already previously approved trips in phases five and six. So if the board's comfortable, um, I think what, what we would likely see um, with a future submission would be a condition that essentially echoed what was in the, the residential, sub, uh, I'm sorry, the, the restaurant approval that says um, no further development of phases five, six, or any of the other unapproved um, buildings on these commercial lots can move forward until um, the left-hand turn lane on Route 1 is approved, or there be an, another traffic study demonstrating they don't need it, but that seems unlikely. So, um, so it would be, so um, I guess the, the short answer is the restaurant could get started, and these five residential buildings could get started and built and occupied without the need for the left turn lane, but any other construction would uh, okay, beyond so phase four. Okay, so anything on what is now known as lot one mm -hmm. or the affordable housing or that area up in the turquoise any of that turquoise area it would be any of the dark blue or the purple the teal color yeah is phase four yeah so the development development of phase four can can occur yeah okay the development what the applicants demonstrate is that the it's the development of phase four the restaurant and these five residential buildings that we'll be talking about next, that traffic is equal to or actually slightly less than what was approved with just the original, what's now six phases of the subdivision. Um, okay. So. okay. Uh, my bottom line was I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, buildings H1 through 5 can actually be constructed if, if we approve that next, uh, next agenda item. Thank you. Without the, without the route one for the end of Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, I was kind of curious on, on lot Y, where you're planning to put the affordable housing. What were you originally going to put there? <coughs> it, I think they were duplexes. It was multifamily in that, in that place originally. Uh, within that location, I think it was more duplexes. Again, I call it more placeholders, if you will, at that point in time. Okay. Uh, again, from our standpoint, the main thing had been really the 264 approved units, if you will. I think if you've, uh, you know, through the history, phase one, I think, was pretty straightforward because that was all pretty much single-family house lots. There were some undersized lots and some estate lots. Everything after that, if you will, as we proceeded through phases two and three uh, of the original subdivision, uh, we've been back in, you know, modifying and providing additional information. The townhouse units uh, that are right along... Uh, uh, Waldron, as you enter from Broad Turn, that actually required site plan approval from this board in terms of the specifics associated with the development of those townhouses and the duplex units as we develop those. Again, we worked with town staff, if you will, in terms of the specific building sizes because, again, what we basically had and they were replaced with just some rectangles, if you will, say, in duplexes. And, and I think that's pretty much what we had there at the time, but it's still pretty much the 10, the, the ten units, if you will. It's just in this case, we're talking about it being the affordable component of that. Okay. Um, I'm basically satisfied. I mean, I, I think it's a good, great project, and I've been following it for a long time, so um, I think it's very interesting to watch how it's going along. But it can be confusing. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it certainly can be. Uh, I'm all set. Thanks. Nick? Yeah, I don't have much by way of questions <coughs> on this. Um, just out of curiosity, though, did you guys ever look into, like, a traffic light? I'm not that I'm in favor of it by any okay. sense, but that's part of the consideration when you just talked about Route 1. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, 
Obviously, even though the applicant would be in the process, would be the one to have to pay for it. I mean, basically, you know, uh, if, from a, a marketing standpoint, it's always a great thing to be able to provide this. You know, we have a traffic light there. DOT is very specific in terms of where and where and how you can put a traffic light on uh, the arterials, if you will. And obviously, as you can, from their standpoint, Route 1, their main point from Route 1 is to get traffic from point A to point B. Uh, so they want to minimize, if you will, the disruptions to that traffic uh, uh, coming in and out. So uh, at this point in time, we we don't meet the warrants uh, to allow a traffic light there. Uh, you know, will that occur at some point in the future? Uh, we, we we certainly hope for, but again, so right now we're basically at the point where we're. Is, th is there a threshold? I think it's more of my question: Is there a threshold as to the amount of traffic that has to go through it there, in order to? There absolutely is, and what they really want to compare that to is not just the traffic. Because it also, in terms of how it relates to the traffic that's coming through on Route 1, how much of that traffic, what the percentage of that is, off the top of my head, I think there's six criteria that has to be met for a warrant in terms of a traffic light on a state road. That was, a, that was just more of a curiosity. Yeah, if I could just jump in on that point. Um, one of the things that uh, our traffic engineer, Bill Bray, peer reviewer, pointed out was there is the potential for future development across the street on the other side of Route 1, and maybe this becomes a more robust intersection and the triggers and requirements for a traffic light are down the road. So one of the things that we had talked about with all the construction work that is going to be going on, obviously building Stewart Drive, it would make sense to put conduit under the road at this point where there is no road um, so that future should it future light be triggered, there should sort of be less disruption and things. So. Um, I just want to sort of point that out. That is something that our peer review traffic engineer looked at, and I'm sure uh, DOT looked at. And and under your current proposal, was there any expansion of Route 1? Is there? I mean, if if you move to that turn lane on each side, are you taking it the, the width from the shoulders? What, how? Are it's actually coming more. If if you're out there now, there's the esplanade, if you will, between the the uh, the uh, roadway and the sidewalk, especially along our frontage, if you will, the project frontage. Uh, we're utilizing the, the, the main, eating up a bit of that, and uh, and then just kind of right reworking everything. But there will be more pavement on our side of the road, if you will. Okay, that's it. Excellent. Well, exciting to think about a fourth traffic light at Dunstan. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, that won't be the headline that comes yeah. out of this. Um, Robin. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what is the status of the DOT permit? It's a good question. They have everything they need. We're just waiting for them to actually uh, to write it back, to be perfectly honest okay. with you. But again, they're comfortable from the st from the fact that uh, DOT is a little more straightforward, if you will, to them. It's all just about numbers and, and traffic that's coming out of this. So right now, from their standpoint, maybe that's why it's hard to get them yeah. pushed. As far as they're concerned, in terms of what we're proposing right now, our initial development we're proposing right now is still under the number that we've permitted for under our TMP. So the, you know, What's it's the general wait time for a DOT permit, Sean? I mean, are you still within that limit, or they? It's uh, it's not like DOT. I mean, DEP, where they actually have a legislative mandate that you know 180 days and they have to issue it. Um, uh, and I think you know, just from trying to get hold of Mr. Susie at DOT, it's obvious that he's become uh, uh, quite inundated. Uh, but we'll stay on him I, again. From him, it's it, if you see it, the actual written permits that come from DOT aren't that. Elaborate. They're usually three or four, and usually no more than five pages. So our hope is certainly that we'll have that within the next few weeks. Okay. And the status of uh, Scarborough Sanitary District? Have they approved the pump station design? They have it for re they're reviewing it as we speak. But it's not approved yet. Uh, no. And again, I would I would anticipate that I could see us going back and forth with them, if you will, in terms of you know the manufacturer, what they provide. What we typically will get from them is they'll say that's fine to go ahead out and get the shop drawings, if you will, from the manufacturer. The shop drawings will come in. We'll send them at again down to, to Dave at, uh, at the uh, Sanitary District for his review. Nine times out of ten, he'll still have some minor comments that we'll make with those and then finalize that. Um, our main point, obviously, is that we have sufficient design associated with what we're looking at so that we can send it to the manufacturer to get the pump station actually, the, the shop drawings actually prepared for them, and obviously that all the infrastructure within Stewart Drive is is, is And they deal with whether or not the pump the pumping station has been sized according to the, to the residential density and Absolutely, and absolutely. Okay. the size of those calculations, yep. the wet wells, the pumps, and all those things are actually part of that submission that we made to them. And then the status of the DEP permit, you said that you talked with them today. I but talked to Ben Viola yeah. today, and uh, okay. his thought was that he would be signing off for it tomorrow, and then it'll be a matter, obviously, of actually getting that amendment written. Okay. And so I guess my question is to staff is that do we, 
don't we does <clears throat> does a does an amendment like this need to have permits in hand before the board can approve? Um, for amendments of sort of this size, the board typically has sought that, but you know it's really ultimately that the board's discretion if you're. Um, I, I did actually one thing I did want to mention, if you don't mind, on sort of the DOT permitting mm -hmm. process. I think one of the things that that's um, just to note is in terms of the um, the detailing of the plan within Route mm -hmm. 1, the left-hand turn lane, DOT, if I, I sort of understand this correctly, and so I'll, I'll look to Angela to <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, is typically as, you know, what they look for is more of a conceptual plan when they do their, when they issue their permit, yep. and then the construction plan set can come a little bit later. So okay. I just want the board to sort of understand that, um, that, you know, I think if the DOT is comfortable with this level of detailing yeah. um, that they would approve their, their permit here and then not once the applicant goes to do their construction, they'd have to put together a full construction plan set that gets a secondary review and approval by DOT but um, would fall under the guise of their okay. permit. So just... So wouldn't you... And are you applying for an Army Corps permit too for the, for the culvert? I made a call to Rod because uh, obviously, you know, this had been reviewed and approved by the DEP and Army Corps back in 2006. Obviously, we're changing that culvert. I talked to Ben. Ben really didn't know, but I think it did come up through a review comment from uh, Woodard and Curran. I did try to call Rod at the end Can of last week. Jay Clement? And I guess I'll give Jay a call next because okay. I didn't get hold of Rod, to be yes, honest I do with. have concern that we don't have permits in hand. Um, and another thing that I guess I'm wondering is how many of these roads will... Um, I, on uh, sheet six, Sean, it says under number 13, general note number 13, that basically uh, that the roads and the in stormwater infrastructure in the subdivision shall remain responsibility of the subdivider until the road is accepted by town council. Yes. Is, is that anticipated to happen, that, that the roads and the subdivision will become um, public uh, roads? All the main roads, absolutely, yes. Okay. Yes. Again, there's alleyways out there, as you may recall, and once you get off Stewart Drive within the, uh, the commercial development, that would all be private. Okay. But Stewart Drive and all the main roads, uh, the intent is that those will all be okay. to the town of Scarborough. And they actually are designed and to be constructed to the town of Scarborough standards. And so again, to staff, I would ask, Mike Shaw has, has reviewed and provided staff comments on this. Yes. Um, we also have a draft um, memorandum of understanding um, okay. talking about the right of way itself through Stewart Drive because there's a lot of amenities obviously in this right of way that are not typical. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we've gone back and forth with with um, Elliot Chamberlain about that. Um, Mike and I have both reviewed that and I think we're very close and no concerns have come up through public work with that. And so who would maintain, I guess, the culvert that's going in? That would be in the town right away. That would be in the uh, town the right away. The future town yes. right away, yes. The future <laughs> town right away. Okay. That would be through a drive. Okay, and have, have, I didn't see any culvert plans in here. I apologize for that. Neither did Angela, and I've, <laughs> I, I can't believe I didn't include those in there. I do have those all detailed out, and that will certainly be within the next. Okay, so second. Mike hasn't had an opportunity to review it. Or Correct. We haven't had any opportunity for the okay. details. But, but I will say it's the exact same design as what we utilized at Leighton Farm, which I think yep. everyone was very pleased with in terms of, you know, the actual design of that culvert. Uh, and again, my apologies, obviously, is that, yeah. you know. Um, what's, the, what's the timeline for construction of Phase 4? Uh, again, we're actually, yeah, we're proposing we had a pre-construction meeting. I mean, the intent is basically to get started out there ASAP in terms yeah. of Phase 4. At least, again, understand it's a long-term process. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of cutting and filling that needs to go on and a lot of those types of things. So, I mean, the construction will certainly be going on for, for months. Yeah. I guess I was just trying to figure out what the hurry, if there was a hurry. Like, I know before with getting the restaurant in and the public demand and things like that, there was a hurry. Um, but I'm also wondering then, too, if, if we are in a hurry, um, I'm wondering what the timeline is. Because is it Phase 6 that we're saying that the affordable housing is going is going to be put and that's amendable I mean we showed it as phase six but I mean I think uh, you know uh, Ellie do you want to answer that at all in terms of I showed it as phase six to, to answer your first question timing I mean honestly we're probably about six months behind schedule already mm -hmm. um, the restaurant was supposed to open in May and we haven't even started digging the foundation yet so um, we're playing with the time game of are we going to lose him or not lose him, mm -hmm. um, that client. So it, timing is extremely important right now. Uh, the person that is going to be owning the uh, 12 townhomes, 
uh, is not as critical, but still timing is, is. I could just ask a clarifying question, Elliot. Is anything, and maybe it's J2, is anything that we're approving here tonight? I mean, I, I thought that the restaurant already had the green light to go ahead. Nothing that we're doing here is going to hold up the restaurant. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, if the fifth amended plan didn't get approved, yep. I guess I would question whether we can continue. We're starting construction this week okay. uh, on a lot of, like Sean said, there is a tremendous amount of uh, earth moving, regrading, yeah. things that wouldn't affect the roadway, pipe laying, stream crossing, things of that nature. You don't have your DEP permits. You don't have, I mean, how can you move forward? Is that not uh, that a question I, I can I, I mean, I'll speak to it a little more, and yeah. Jay can speak to it as a kind of point of order a little bit, but I, I think generally speaking, we have not approved yeah. things at this scale without a DEP yeah. permit, and, and there are a lot of other sort of technical details. I mean, I think it's at a good spot overall, but um, as I came in here tonight, I was not anticipating that we would be at a point where we could approve I'm not tonight. either. Yeah. So I, I would Jay, maybe you could speak a little bit too, and, and then we'll yeah. we'll still have more. You'll still okay. have more opportunity to. Okay. And I'm sure. Yeah. So I'll I'll start, and maybe I'll okay. turn to Angela as well. But I just want to you know make clear that so, um, obviously going back to 2006, we had sort of the approved overall subdivision, which was you know the colorful map. Um, so there is an approved right of way and roadway. Stewart Drive is an approved right away with an approved road design. What the applicant's doing for a host of reasons and, and staff is appreciative is they originally had a crossing of Bilt Brook as part of that and it was sort of what would be approved back in 2006, just sort of a standard round pipe. And so they're, they're really updating that and enhancing that to sort of today's standards and expectations. So that's certainly a, a positive. What I think Mr. Chamberlain referenced, we actually held a pre-construction meeting so they could begin mm -hmm. construction of the road, understanding that, as was just stated, there's a whole lot of work to do. If you'll remember from the site visit, uh, the site that he's looking to develop, these properties specific, um, closer to Route 1, are currently, a, you know, they're an old gravel pit. So there's a lot of filling and grading work that sort of needs to be done before they even get to sort of the stream crossing area. So. Um, it's sort of it's staffs um, uh, where we're at right now is they have the ability to begin work on putting Stewart Drive through, and you know, um, it, but and that gives us time to work on what that final crossing design looks like prior to the board doing a final sort of amended approval, if you will. And Angela, yeah, um, it's, I guess it's a little complex. We mm -hmm. did move ahead with, um, like I said, the pre-construction meeting and. As Jay mentioned, it's going to take a while, and I think um, while there is this time ticking, this timeline that happens, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be approved tonight, but it should be approved in the next, I'm sure he's hoping next meeting, but it could go a couple of months while they kind of catch up, but they still have, like he said, an approved plan that um, they could build today without this approval tonight. Okay. So what obviously he doesn't want to do that just in the fact that you don't want to put in infrastructure and then rip it out because they have a more updated plan. So it's going to get to a point where it will be a crunch because that window will close and we'll say um, without the board approval he can't move forward because he doesn't want to put the curb there or he doesn't want to, you know, crosswalks and sidewalks need to get installed. You know yeah. what I'm saying? The details, yep. getting into that kind of detail that really um, needs to be really honed in. Thank you. So. Thank but you. but to, to, you brought up four items. The DEP permit probably is not that far away. We're probably looking at in the one to four week range. Um, the sewer district, we've been working with the sewer district for the last four or five months going back and forth. So it's not like we just dropped a design in their lap and they're looking at it for the first time. We've been designing something that they've been asking for for quite a few months. So when we gave them a finalized plan, it's pretty much what they've been asking for. So that is, you know, they're just going through the final details with their outside consultants, but we don't see any issues there whatsoever. And they were also at the pre-construction meeting and, and conveyed that to staff that they were comfortable where, where, where they were at. Yeah, and the DOT, obviously, because of the fact we are putting five and six on a complete hold until that left-hand turn would be in, 
I think everybody feels comfortable because that could be three or four years before we start five or six. Um, we would expect that uh, probably in the next couple of months we would see final, you know, final answers from DOT. Okay, um, so, so then that means three or four years then to <coughs> before the affordable housing um, units are are built. No, I'm not saying that at all. Um, we, I think what most likely will happen with the affordable housing is because uh, it's right directly uh, fronts on Stewart Drive, <coughs> excuse me, there's a chance we, we don't have to go phase five then phase six. We don't have to follow them in numerical order. Um, there's a chance I may come back and break uh, six up into a six and a seven and literally jump to seven, just the affordable housing, do that, and then pick away at uh, yeah. five and six over the years. It, and I just, uh, on the affordable housing question, so again, um, this is very reminiscent of a conversation we had in December with, obviously it's a very large project, 200, if I'm, I'm trying to remember what the numbers were, and actually I think I got them in my memory. We were originally, we were originally approved for 240, and we had two 10% density bonuses that we were allowed to do if we wanted to. So the, the the base net residential density for all the colored phases, mm -hmm. phases one through six, was 240 units. The approval allowed for an affordable housing density bonus um, of an additional, it was 24 units. Of those 24 units, 10 need to be affordable. The original approval sort of had those sprinkled, as I said at the outset, sort of in phase one. I can't remember either. Two they, were three, sprinkled they, through, they, they were sprinkled, they were sprinkled throughout. throughout and designed to be home ownership. And, and there's been a series of amendments to that condition that this board has done. Again, sort of recognizing the, the you know, difficulties that have been with securing those. <coughs> and part of what uh, um, I think is worth why, why we wanted the board to sort of recognize the change that's being proposed here, not dissimilar to what was being proposed at Eastern Village back in December, is those, the density bonus doesn't come into play until phase six. So they could build out 240 units without ever having to, you know, there is no requirement for affordable housing. It's a, it's a bonus. The, app, the, the developer has to give some and the town gives some so they can get the additional 14 market rate. So I think what we'd look at is similar to what the, this board did with the condition at Eastern Village. Again, if the board's comfortable with this approach, would be to say phase six wouldn't be able to begin until the applicant sort of has a, a, an affordable housing program um, that's acceptable to the housing alliance in place. And so basically what it would do is say, you can build out those 240 units, you know, it, mm -hmm. but until you get, you can't get 241 okay. until you have the, and so again, um, as I mentioned, the applicant's representative met with the Alliance back in November. The Alliance seemed generally comfortable with moving in this direction, um, but that's why uh, I wanted to flag this as one of those sort of umbrella items to be yeah. sure the board's comfortable with because yeah. uh, as we just talked about there's a lot of details before staff thinks this would be ready for an approval but we want to be sure that the board's comfortable with sort of these baseline elements because um, you know if the board has an issue then we would like to know about that now um, yeah. so yeah. hopefully that was helpful thank you so very much so i'm all set mr thank chair you. uh rachel um <clears throat> I had a couple of questions, most a uh, couple, and basically they've they've been answered. Um, one of my concerns was coming out of Stewart Drive and turning left, um, but that smoothing area or a middle lane or whatever it's going to be that takes care of that because I know what the traffic looks like along there, and folks are going to again take their lives in their hands as they get out of there, especially in the summer. Um, but knowing that's there, that that response to that. Um, I had a question as well on the affordable housing um, and on the housing squares that you have on Stewart Drive. I don't, I, I don't know whether they're duplexes, they pass the Paulson, they're the, the I, I know they're right in this area. Yeah, I, and, yeah. And, Those and I wasn't involved at the beginning of this. I'm 
I need some background each, to be very Each helpful. one of those uh, rectangles is designed to be a duplex. The reason they're just squares or duplexes, we don't know what they're going to look like yet. Um, I haven't actually designed that particular building. Um, those are going to stay duplexes, so you have 10 in that area, and you'll see we're picking up one right on the uh, turnpike side of Waldron up in this area. So that gives you the 11 duplexes for a total of 22 units plus the 12 estate lots for a total of 34. Okay, so Waldron, uh, the one in one in Waldron, is that already being built? Or? No. This okay. Right now, Waldron stops uh, right where this mm -hmm. yellow ends okay. right now. Yep. Um, we haven't, we've gotten within about 75 feet of that stream um, the, before that crossing, and then we'll be continuing over to Stewart Drive, and we're going to go take a right-hand turn towards the turnpike and pick up one estate lot and one duplex. Okay, okay. Uh, had there been any thought at the beginning that those duplexes would be part of the affordable housing? Yeah, the, that was the original design, is that all the affordable units would be home ownership. And basically, in a give you the short version, the economics were such that it wasn't even worth doing the 14 to do the 10, that you'd, e you'd still be in a negative. We were kind of caught between having to get the unit low enough to make it work for an affordable unit that you, I probably would have needed 30 or 40 extra units to make, that, to make that number work. And to get the number where we could with the extra 14, we were caught between not quite being low enough for somebody could still afford it, and yet the people that could afford it didn't need the help. So we got caught in the middle ground, and then the project across the street on Broad Turn Road um, by the Turnpike, the city Habitat for Humanity. Habitat. Right. That is an affordable project. So we felt that, okay, now there is some affordable home ownership right in that area. If we were going to do affordable units, could we switch over to affordable rentals? Um, and we started talking with uh, the manager and the town planner three, four years ago about this concept. And, and now we're finally uh, in the process of trying to get that approval back. That, um, so the lower purple blotch there, you're looking at affordable rentals. That's right. We, the idea is to build uh, 10 units right here. Whether it's two five-unit buildings or one 10-unit building, we're not 100% sure. Um, but right, that's where the... Uh, and we felt if we were going to do the rental, instead of them being all by themselves somewhere in the uh, neighborhood, that being up near the commercial, whether it be you could walk to certain services, you have a completely open field across the street uh, for a view, um, there's apartments that are going to be in the village area anyway, so it seemed to make sense to have them up there. Um, so that was the thought process behind that. Is that a, that field across the that open field across the way going to be used for anything in terms of recreation? Or? Yes, it will be obviously used for the neighborhood. But I think in the original design there was some talk about uh, it would actually be made uh, accessible to the town itself for informal practices games. Um, as long as the scheduling worked out with the association, because the association will end up ultimately owning that and maintaining it, but that the town would have the rights to use it. Thank you. All set? Mm -hmm. Rick? Um, I just have a question as to the lighting of that corner, maybe, because I'm a big fan of street lighting as opposed to traffic lights. I hate traffic lights. Um, is there a lighting plan that was submitted with the... I wasn't here for the beginning of that either, so... Um, is there a lighting plan that... There is a lighting plan associated with the overall uh, yep. uh, development of the... I thought, there, I thought there was, but I just didn't see a lighting plan for that. But I will say there was some specific uh, discussions with the uh, traffic engineer in terms of lighting at the intersection itself, so uh, yeah. certainly I will look at that and make sure that you have sufficient lighting. At the intersection. Yeah, that'd be my preference as opposed to a traffic light. Um, a lot of times lights on the island, just something to call attention to the fact that there's something going on is a good idea. So. That's the only comment. Okay. Right. Thanks. All right, so again, I think, um, you know, as others have said, we're generally in a good place and on, on a good trajectory here and certainly some technical and kind of coordination details to work through. Sounds like starting even tomorrow during your meeting. 
Um, and we've got the permits that are outstanding, um, most critically the DEP for purposes of our um, approval process. And hopefully you will have that in the next next couple days. Um, appreciate the updates on affordable housing, um, and I'm I'm fine with that with that approach, and glad that the that the alliance continues to play an active role in these in these projects, as we've seen the last couple meetings with Eastern Village and now this one. Um, and you know, just as a general comment on the timing, you know, certainly appreciate the time sensitivity and and the, the sort of seasonal and economic factors that come into play there, and sensitive to those closing windows. And I th think the town and the staff and the board have all you know tried to be cooperative and creative, even in sort of breaking things out and letting things move forward. And so hopefully we will get get to approval on this next time and you can keep on absolutely no and I certainly again I uh, you know I, I certainly appreciate all the consideration that's been given here we truly do uh, like we said basically the first thing we did was have a meeting with DEP because as, as Angela says we have a DEP permit right now we could go basically build Stewart Drive if you will sure. as it currently was approved which as we all know doesn't isn't 2006 and 2000 now 17 uh, you know, we've learned quite a bit, if you will, from a stormwater management standpoint and certainly from a, uh, uh, an urban impact and stream standpoint in terms of things that we'd want to do different than we were proposing in 2006. Uh, and basically from DEP's perspective, when you do an amendment, then they have the right at that point in time to start asking you to update everything. That hasn't already been constructed. Well, we didn't want to play the game. Well, let's go build everything for us and yeah. then let's, you know, let's, let's negotiate about what we can and can't do. So again, we certainly appreciate uh, the town working with us on that because yeah, and for your Obviously, part, obviously, from a design standpoint, we yeah. want to make sure that you know the design's going to work. So we build this thing once, and it's something that you know right. everyone's happy with from a from an environmental standpoint, from a, the town standpoint, the DEP standpoint, and that's what we've been trying to come from. And it's, it has been very complicated. There's been no doubt about it, and uh, uh, there's been a lot of moving parts associated with this. It certainly was much more involved than I think we all thought when we yeah. first started on this. You know, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, when we started the process, I thought this is what we were going to be dealing with, you know what I mean, which is basically this whole development up here within these two lots. And certainly the thing has expanded uh, quite dramatically since that point in time. Um, but again, hopefully we have a project, yeah. and I think we are very close to, you know, having a project at this point in time that the design uh, meets current standards and that everybody has, has been involved in, uh, you know, for the last few months. So Great. I think we're almost there. Good. And as Jay said, I think, you know, we, we appreciate the way You've approached it as well and <coughs> should be there soon. So, um, On a related topic, we can move on to the next item. We would like to obviously introduce this, the, the site plan associated. Mark will make Absolutely. the initial presentation of that for the residential component and of we'll, this. Uh, and we do have that set up as a separate agenda item, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, <coughs> I'll introduce it and let uh, Jay give a little more of an intro and then you guys can take it away. Uh, the next item, uh, Dunstan Properties LLC requests a site plan review for multifamily buildings, Assessor's Map U30, Lot 17. Jay? Sure. Um, I'll be fairly quick in my overview on this since we've been, obviously this is sort of part and parcel of what we were just looking at. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, just sort of like to lay out sort of three main elements, again, sort of keeping it at the high level. Um, one, we just have a couple of zoning compliance questions or issues that really need to be sure they're fully flushed out. One is that the unit types that are labeled don't necessarily match what the net residential calculation calls for. It's important to recognize that a one-bedroom unit, you're trying to count a one-bedroom unit as a half a unit for net residential calculation purposes. That, that unit also needs to be less than 750 square feet. And on the floor plans, there's a couple one bedrooms that are identified at 809 feet or what have you. So they would actually exceed that threshold. So I don't think, I think they can still fit what they're looking to do under the overall 35 number that's allowed, but it's not the 30 that they calculated. So um, I just want to be sure everyone's aware of that. Also want to just be sure we're clear on the building footprint. I think the building is identified at 9,800 odd feet. The TVC limits a single building to no more than 10,000 square foot footprint, and I want to be sure that the 9,800 odd square feet includes that breezeway and sort of garage 
area that's all attached because that's all counted as contiguous footprint. So I think it's important that we're clear on those items. Then just more, more globally, sort of zooming out a bit further in terms of site layout. Um, obviously, board members remember we did a site visit here, and I think as part of that, one of one of the issues that I thought you know we sort of heard voiced um, was about the proximity of building H5 to the property boundary, and so um, just wanted to be sure the board was really looking at and thinking about um, the buffering that that might might be or might not be um, uh, in place given some of the grading that's done. There's a sort of swale back there, sort of how everything fits in that area. Um, and then the final item, and we talked about this at sketch plan, buildings H1 through H4, the sort of ends of those buildings um, are sort of blank facades. Our design standards talk about um, not having blank facades when you're facing sort of a park, air, park area or more of a public space. Uh, I think the applicant and their response to that comment um, is proposing to put some trellises with growing vines, and so um, just want to be sure that the board is taking a look at that detail and, and noting if that sort of meets what the board would expect to meet the town standards or if other uh, detail to attention might be required. Um, so I guess with that, Mr. Chair, it's sort of, again, you have uh, comments from Woodard and Curran and from Bill Bray, more specific just to these five buildings. Um, again, some more plan coordination that I'm sure we can flush out in the in the coming weeks. Um, but with that, I turn it back to you this time. Thanks, and I'll turn it back to the applicant's team. Good evening, my name is Mark Burns with Foresight Architects, representing Elliott Chamberlain. I'm going to speak to the site plan a little bit. Uh, what I'd like to do, I know you've reviewed your packages, but I'd like to be able to um, show you a little bit of the overview first and then get into some of the details as perspective of the uh, staff comments. We're, we're looking at a site plan that has five buildings, four townhouses, and one multi-unit, 34-unit uh, building, uh, which is three stories. The layout of the parking lot is around the perimeter, along with the major arteries through the center of the uh, site plan. Uh, the major traffic circulation should follow that circle. It is a one-way circle, except at this point where it is a two-way in order to connect the parking lot. The parking lots also have <coughs> an exit at Stewart Drive. The calculations as general uh, do meet the criteria as far as the required parking per unit. Um, I'd also like to address the landscaping. Uh, the landscaping has been, has evolved from the master plan through the site plan review. And so it, it has had a lot of uh, review, has had a lot of uh, adjustment, and uh, we think it's a very elaborate and sensitive uh, landscape plan. We've addressed the landscaping around the townhouses in a very similar but different way from <coughs> the center lawn, which is to act as almost a common feature, uh, sort of connecting the buildings and giving it a sense of place. It also creates a visual vista to the uh, apartment building at the end. Uh, we think that that's a pretty strong statement. Um, in addition, we have dealt with the perimeter planting uh, to create buffers. And uh, we've used a, uh, a mixture of deciduous and evergreen to give it color throughout the year and also to give it um, sort of a, a more dynamic look. In addition to that, 
we have uh, we've addressed Route 1 with a berm, and uh, that berm will be planted as well in a very uh, unique way. Uh, it accommodates uh, not only the, the grassy knoll structure, but it also uh, deals with uh, the changes between um, uh, the grass areas and also offers some ground cover. Uh, again, that's, uh, that's intended to, uh, to make that a really nice feature as you pass by at 35, 40 miles an hour on the one. I probably just about five miles an hour over the speed limit. But <laughs> 10 miles less than people are actually going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a key source of town revenue right there. <laughs> I'd like to address um, the staff questions, um, each individually. Uh, the first is uh, asks us to provide bike racks, and, uh, and we are uh, on board with that. We expect to uh, provide them at the apartment building and uh, at the commercial buildings throughout the, uh, the site in the future, as well as the, uh, we've been asked to do it at the restaurant and uh, we are going to include them there. Uh, we haven't provided them at the townhouses because that is a more private feature, and uh, in most cases they do have outside storage, and they also have inside storage. A lot of people, um, we're thinking that people using bike racks nowadays aren't for long-term storage because they, they put their bike at risk. Uh, they tend to be for people who are commuting or using them as a mode of transportation rather than recreation. Pedestrian crosswalks will be added. And those pedestrian crosswalks will be added at several locations. Uh, we're looking at crosswalks from the apartment building to sidewalks, sidewalks to the center uh, common and connecting the commercial areas. However, we're, uh, we're not proposing uh, crosswalks at areas that are merely at, at, a, uh, at a parking lot. You know, we'll, we'll do it at the major vehicular location. The min minimum planting size requirements um, required by the town for overstory trees are two and a half inches. Um, and we're going to propose an uh, inch and a half caliper because we think that they, they take better, they're healthier, and um, they catch up very quickly. Um, as well, the uh, flowering understory trees at a two inch caliper, we're proposing at an inch and a half caliper as well. We think that uh, in addition to their health and, and really how they grow from the start, there's also a much greater selection uh, availability in the nurseries when you go to the inch and a half versus the two and a half. <coughs> in the landscape coordination and grading plan, uh, there was comment uh, as to Having the having trees planted in the swales, we are going to move those where we do show them in a swale. The lighting photometrics um, have identified two areas which have spillover, and they are in these locations here and here in this corner, and they are very slight. We're going to add deflectors to the lighting in order to curve that down and pull it within the boundary lines. We're also going to add timers to the lights in order to reduce the lighting at the uh, early mornings and uh, in the early evenings. Those will most likely be uh, solar actuated so that it'll be accurate with the, uh, the need for light. There was a question about uh, whether or not the uh, the building was a two-story or a three-story. In fact, it is a three-story and will be shown as that. Um, in addition, on the 
townhouse units, there was question at the, mas at the master planning meeting and also in these comments as to how we'll deal with the size of these townhouses. And uh, they don't have windows, and that would seem to be the element that uh, uh, planning board members had, uh, had issue with. Uh, we are going to plan on planting uh, ivy and having also a uh, trellis element. Like they're on sheet L four oh one, maybe. We'll be looking at a series of posts spaced uh, uniformly, and uh, within those posts, there'll be some horizontal connectors. Those posts and the horizontal connectors will be behind a screen. Uh, the posts and connectors will be horizontal connectors, will be cedar and will gray out and look nice for the patina. The screens themselves will be a, um, a galvanized uh, lattice. And that galvanized lattice uh, will, will be a metal lattice, but it'll hold up over the years. It'll also have a patina to it. But we're going to grow uh, English ivy under it. And uh, we think that that's extremely hardy. It's going to be green year round. And uh, we think that it'll, it'll grow relatively quickly. Um, and we think that's a much better option than a stockade fence or uh, a solid fence because it has a nice, soft living uh, feature to it. <coughs> The last question was the fact that uh, the three-story building elevations don't show any roof vents so that you're not able to see whether or not there are uh, any large venting structures on the building. In fact, the building has a flat roof. It, it shows a roof in the, in the front and around the perimeter as a, it's a mansard roof made to give the illusion of, of uh, a sloped roof. But with a building of this size, uh, a slow, appropriate slope would bring it way over the uh, the um, height limits, and so uh, it's a fairly typical ploy that uh, that architects use nowadays with with buildings, and um, I think it works out pretty well. It, it's enough to give the building uh, some character, uh, as you can see. Uh, it, it really does fit with that building. Uh, the actual roof is down below, at this point, the flat roof. And, um, and the flat roof is hiding all of the vents, the uh, rooftop units. Uh, it's actually an EPDM or membrane roof. If this roof were, were to be a uh, full slope, it would probably be up here because the building is up to 60 feet wide. And you know, the appropriate pitches are, uh, you know, 812, uh, and you do want to be looking at a, at a 412. I know that many times you look at a pitch as being appropriate to, uh, to New England, and therefore, usually speaking. And that would be the, the, uh, the questions. <coughs> so I'd open that up to, uh, to questions from you if, uh, if you'd like. Okay. So with that there, okay.
Um, I don't think we have anyone out there for public comment, but I'll throw it out there. No? Okay. Let's start down here this time. Rick? I actually don't have any questions. No? Sorry. Okay. I thought it looked good. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the plans and it's still showing 20 feet. Um, one of the questions that folks had was, can uh, emergency vehicles get around in this parking area? Uh, and you're showing a 20-foot um, driveway mm -hmm. to the parking lot. And do you know that the that's all right for the emergency vehicles? Well, hi highway lane is 12 feet wide. And uh, this is 20. Uh, the fire department has looked at it. And uh, I'd have to ask Jay uh, whether or not they had any, any question as to whether or not it would restrict them. Um, I haven't heard any concerns from our fire department, but I did, I guess the part of the reason we flagged it is this would be a waiver um, request. And so as, as was just stated, um, typically a fire lane is 20 feet wide. And so um, I guess we'd just look for the applicant with their next submission to provide that sort of written narrative for the board to consider a waiver on. Don't know that staff has any particular concerns at this point um, that I've heard from public safety, which is where we typically would hear from I, in particularly private roads or private alleyways. So, um, and, and how would the emergency vehicles get into the back of building H5? Or is there no access? Uh, there, is there is no access. They have access on three sides. But not a really long side. Okay. The front. Yes, but, but not the, the one side that they don't have access to um, is the, the longest, is one of the long. Right. And this the building is provided fully with the supervised fire suppression system. You know, that saves a lot. People don't die in buildings. The, the fire department does have, the town has a pretty robust fire lane ordinance, or uh, more than just a fire lane ordinance, but uh, fire um, uh, fire prevention, public safety ordinance that has fire lane requirements based on building size, oc uh, occupancy loads, and, and such forth. Um, and does this mean? And so our fire department has reviewed it and has indicated that they're, they're satisfied. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question, I'm still seeing the snow sto uh, st storage in that median green area, um, which is now landscaping covered with trees. Mm -hmm. Is that going to... There is, there is, you see snow storage in a multitude of areas. I would think that center green, or that pocket pocket, as you might want to call it, um, would only probably be used in a severe uh, snow accumulation situation. Uh, if you remember two years ago, that might have been one of those years. Um, I would think in this case probably the snow storage is, most of the snow is probably going to get picked up and brought to the rear of the site. You'll see a snow storage uh, in this location on your plan mm -hmm. uh, and again on the other side uh, at the head of that field. Um, during a heavy snow accumulation I would think that uh, we would uh, between snow blowers and w one of the things that has changed and especially in some of these more dense sites is the use of plows gets less and less and the use of snow blowers gets more and more. Um, and what we find is we tend to move the snow around instead of just plow the snow down into a corner. Um, and in a case like this, there's not enough room just to plow down into the corner and lose multiple parking spots. Um, so most of the time, even, uh, even an eight or nine inch storm, most of the snow would be moved to the back of the site. Uh, another question I had was the question on, uh, that you mentioned uh, with the blank sides of the townhouses. Had you considered windows or evidently the answer was no and could you tell me why? Well, th this, is, this design, we've used this design before in this particular townhouse. Uh, it's an extremely popular design and the layout of these units just don't allow for windows uh, on the ends of the buildings. There's one spot uh, on the second floor you could add a window, but it would deteriorate the use of that bed bedroom so much that there really wouldn't be any place because there's already uh, windows out to the back of the unit. What we find is uh, to get efficiencies in the unit, to get the, the highest use out of the unit for the tenant, 
um, you do end up with this one blank wall um, at the end of the building. That's why we've, we were talked about that at a previous meeting and that's when uh, Tom came up with the idea of doing the fence with the, uh, the uh, growth on it along with trees being planted around that. So it's not just, um, it's not just the six foot uh, English ivy fence. Uh, I mean, you're going to be going down a one-way street with trees before you get to the building, trees lining the park on the other side of the street, uh, street trees along the road itself beside the building here, and then uh, trees along the building with the English ivy. So I think there's going to be quite a bit going on visually that whereas if you were to just put this building with no landscaping, I would agree that end of the building or just that uh, English ivy fence wouldn't be enough, but with everything else that's going on, we feel pretty strongly it does take care of it. How far away is the trellis from the building? Uh, approximately 15, 10, 10, 12 feet, right in that neighborhood. So there's not going to be a moisture build up causing mold along the side of the building because it's blocked by that? No, and that was one of our concerns about looking at some type <laughs> of uh, uh, material right up against the building is that we potentially could have a mold or, or water issue or other type of infestations. So we elected to bring it, you know, farther away from the building where you could still maintain the lawn between them um, and still not still provide some privacy uh, visually and uh, not cause a problem for the building. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Along the same line, can you just show me where along the building, which side it's going to be, where the trellis is? We would be facing the four end, facing the pocket park. Okay. And it's, you say, 10 to 12 feet off the building? Yep. Okay. And the buildings are two or three stories? These H1 through H4 are all two stories. Two stories, and the trellis is six feet high, was it? Uh, six feet high and approximately a foot off the ground, so a okay. total of total of almost seven feet. Seven feet versus, okay. And I would assume you might gain another half a foot, you know, with the English ivy growing by the time it gets to the top of the... What do you do with snow that builds up between the two of them? I mean, it, the, the, parking, the, the sidewalk is in front, right, of the... Yes. Okay. Yep. Trellis, okay. I mean, if snow becomes a problem, yeah. uh, if there's any venting there for any uh, furnace equipment or anything like that, uh, and if snow became a problem uh, for direct vents, then obviously it would have to be removed. Right. Yeah. Um, could we talk about the parking lot right near there, too, where you have the one-to-one -one slope? Um, uh, nope, to the right yeah, there. Rip yeah, with riprap. And, um, I guess I'm wondering why you didn't use a retaining wall. Because that's that's pretty what's it's pretty high, and that's a pretty steep slope. Uh, and again, that was Sean Frank, the engineer. You know, basically going with so the rip wrap along Frank. through there, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, 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 and obviously, you know, it was just more from a grading perspective. But I mean, I've obviously talked to Elliot about maybe some uh, uh, the okay. potential changes to that. But again, it was just you know, I was just going with the one to one slope to make what up are, the What are the typical soils there? I mean, are you going to have trouble with the native soils there? No, 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 no experience out there. It's actually been a pretty sandy, a pretty granular Is soil. It We've seen, uh, okay. Remember, there's actually a gravel pit to the back of right. this uh, that they had utilized. So, uh, you know, most of what we've seen out there has yeah. been from the natural soils, uh, are pretty decent soils out there. I apologize, I didn't make it to the site walk there too. So, um, but I know in that same area too, staff had also mentioned about landscaping in that same area, whether or not the proposed vegetation will function and thrive with the proposed grading along the backside of H5. Right, now I have a small swale there, but it is relatively small swale, but again, I, I think uh, uh, Mark did mention that, that in fact that they were going to revise that landscape in just a little bit and certainly we'll make sure that coordination occurs okay. between me and them. I, I apologize if, if you already addressed that. Um, I guess just just to answer the question that, that, or just to sort of probe a little bit more into the um, the footprint issue that Jay talked about, um, does that uh, building um, include the breezeway and attached utility building to make sure that we're under the 10,000 square foot? Yeah, my response to that is that uh, that building and breezeway constitute about 400 square feet. And in order to accommodate that, we would be pulling the front 
in the back of the building in okay. about a foot and a half. To stay under the 10,000. To stay under the 10,000. And I think would be about 25 square feet under the. Okay. I guess w one thing I'd want to clarify is yeah. do we have to count the trash uh, garage if, in that 10,000? If it's attached by the breezeway, yes. Okay. If that breezeway wasn't there, then it would be two separate buildings. But when they're attached, Right, which doesn't count. make sense for a tenant to have to go <coughs> outdoors to go back indoors. But. Still on me, okay. Um, just real quick question about the lighting. Um, given the residential na nature of the internal buildings, you did talk about putting timers or some type of like motion sensor type thing out there. Um, that's all I have for questions. Mr. Okay. Chair. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I, I forgot to something. Um, and, and that is uh, something that Bill Bray mentioned, which is the, the traffic signs within the, uh, uh, or some sort of traffic control within the, the development there. Because I, I can see, especially um, visitors who might not be familiar with um, the layout, heading, heading one way on a one way street past. Uh, my glasses on here, building H1 and 2, and then getting towards building H5 in a two-way street, but not recognizing that and just kind of... And, and it's something we around. appreciate it as well. Uh, actually, the, the applicant's been working with uh, public services in terms of, the, we'll actually have a name associated with that, if you will, so that'll kind of give us a street sign, so then we can kind of add a sign to that, but I will certainly... Would, uh, would there be um, do, stop signs? Absolutely. So there is stop signs on the side, uh, and again, what we'll certainly have is, you know, uh, the one way do not enter on the other side of that. So uh, I'll certainly, uh, I did see uh, Mr. Bray's comments as well, and certainly we'll make sure we address okay. those. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Nick? Thank you. Uh, good job to my fellow board members. Didn't leave much uh, meat on the bone for me. Um, but I will clarify a couple things. Uh, snow storage was mentioned, and this is so minor. And, and I'm not sure, I didn't catch all of it, but it, I don't know if this is what was asked. Was in the village green, you have a big, big area for. Was that the question? Okay, thanks. I, I did hear the answer, I didn't hear the <laughs> question fully. So. All right, thank you. Um, and then. Crosswalks, I think I've got, the crosswalks look good on sheet 205, and then I noticed that they kind of disappeared and it could be buried under other lines that are there, but I just wanted to make sure we were consistent as to the crosswalks are going to be on Stewart Drive on both sides of the entrance into around the Village Green, correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. And then trellis. Let's talk trellis. I'm not crazy about trellis. Um, what other options were there? What was under consideration? I mean, uh, you didn't want to do windows. Okay, I get it. Um, but what were some of the other alternatives you, you looked at before landing on trellis? Uh, I mean, really, after that, it, uh, you do a heavier sense of landscaping or larger trees. Or if you're looking at the physical building, you're looking at false or fake applications to the, to the side of the building. Um, I know I was uh, hammered pretty hard last time about fake windows, <laughs> so I didn't want to go down that road. Um, and I don't, you know, when you start adding those false applications to the side of a building, they, I don't care how good of a job you do, that's just what they look like. They look fake, they look false. Um, so we really didn't want to try to do that. So the next way was we didn't think at the time uh, making the landscaping so dense that it, it looked overdone. Uh, or became an issue uh, health-wise for the trees, and the trellis was the next issue. Um, there wasn't enough room to really do a large berm, um, so every time we looked at it, we kept coming back to some type of screening, and the... Yeah, it seems like you land on screening rather than structural or uh, architectural styling, yes. which is what I think, as far as we look at the ordinances and that we, we have to reference during this, we're dealing with more of an architectural styling. Right, not necessarily a shading or a, a hiding of what's there. That's why I was asking what what other options you had been considering when doing this. And you know, for my money, I'd rather see a large shade tree there than a trellis. You, you know, that eats up some of the view of that house. But that's a, a personal view. 
we still have, a, as a board, I think, got to consider the whole architectural stylings of this, uh, as, as Jay has pointed out in his memo. So I was hoping that there was some other easy fix to this that doesn't include fake windows and, um, you know, fake stone facades that look really, really fake. You know, there's got to be. What I, what I wanted to know was what else was thrown around. I'd like to. Actually, if, if I might make one thing. I just ask. I heard one of the comments was about the potential there might be a, a, um, uh, a venting system, sort of on the side of the buildings. Might a venting stack be able to be incorporated as sort of break up that side, whether it be a, a true chimney or something of that ilk? Well, um, they they are direct vent units, and yes, you could build a venting stack. I've never seen one actually add. Cool. Visual appeal. <laughs> <laughs> Be a pioneer. Does it break it up? Yes. Does it look good? No. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, certainly we could go back and see if there's something uh, we're missing uh, from some type of faults or some type of application we could apply to the outside. Um, maybe a different siding material. We, you know, obviously, I'm not going to lie, cost was certainly a, a, a consideration. And you know we Sometimes, kept we kept coming know, back to the screening. A different style of siding or something yeah. just on part of it makes just breaks it up a little bit, gives it a little bit of interest. Just just kicking around. And of course, I don't know if I'm the minority right now talking. So I think the other board members should kind of let you know if they're feeling the trellis. Right. I'm not feeling the trellis. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that's where I fall on that. Let's I see. could do a trellis on two and a shade tree on two. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we did get an answer on the square footage of the building. You did say you're going to have to knock off an inch, uh, I'm sorry, a foot and a half off the width of your building? Well, either either the length or the width. Obviously, we're right now we're about 10,390, 10,395, including that breezeway of the garage. So I think what's going to happen, we're going to steal a little from the garage, a tiny bit from the breezeway, and the bulk of that 390 feet from the building. So between the back, front, and the ends, um, we can't, as Jay just said, we can't uh, go over the 10,000 footprint if that garage, we were under 10,000 without the garage and breezeway. The garage and breezeway put us a little bit over. And I wasn't thinking the garage and breezeway were counted in the, um, in that 10,000. Okay. And if you're going to lose a foot and a half anywhere, try to pull it off the back side of that lot and get it off well, the line Yeah, ob obviously if we were to narrow up the building, right. We would, the back of the building would get that many more feet away from that rear property line. I, that was asked. Right. I wouldn't give it to the front. I'd give it to the rear. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and then I think that's it. That's it. Thank Thanks, you. Nick. Right. Sure. Uh, actually, first I have a question for Jay. Uh, uh, and this actually came up when we were talking previously about the uh, restaurant. When when something is in the TVC zone. They have no appeal to like either for fire or add extra square footage or anything like that. In other words, they can't go to the zoning board of appeals or anything like that. Correct. It's just that's that's so it's in stone and that's it. Okay. All right. Um, I actually uh, have some questions regarding the townhouses and the apartment complex. Um, on the townhouses, was it was it ever clarified whether those are rentals or ownership? All rentals, but technically they could be the way we've set up at least the uh, condominium docks, uh, because that's really what this is: is a condominium association, a commercial condominium association. Is that potentially, as long as the town uh, had no reason, legal reason why they couldn't, they could someday be turned into individual condominium units. But the I, we're building them as rental units. Okay. Interesting. And isn't there some impact on parking or traffic or something on? I think Bill Bray had some comments regarding um, um, looking at traffic counts during the PM peak hour. So I think um, that's just something that we'll okay. detail to have. But it, it's my understanding the count wouldn't change whether it was a owned or rented. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not hung up on the tr uh, trellises. <laughs> um, but I do have a question on uh, on building H1 and H2 because those, the, the sides that are going to be facing Route 1, you don't show any trellises there, right? We don't. Between, between the trees, uh, the parking lot, the berm in front of the parking lot towards Route 1, we felt that was sufficient. Okay. 
the berm and what's planted on the berm will exceed the height of the trellis. Okay. From Route 1, especially in a seated position. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> on to Building H. Um, I was on the site walk and uh, I thought that was a that was a lot of mass right there. H5 right? you're talking about? H. You said Building H. H5. H5. You're talking about H5 just for, so everyone knows. Okay. For okay. Um, there was a lot of, that's a lot of mass very close to that abutter right yep. there. And, um, and I, I was wondering, um, the, uh, it was mentioned in the, um, in the comments about maybe eliminating the on-street parking right in front of the building and moving the building further, I guess, south a little bit. Is that the direction towards the parking lot? That was the suggestion, yeah. and I'm 0% in favor. Oh. <laughs> And what you've got is, we are, our traffic, our parking count, not traffic counts, our parking counts are adequate, but we don't have a tremendous amount of extra parking spots. When the planning board asked us to delete eight on the other side, what we did was we really cut the site in half right down the center of Stewart Drive and said, okay, most people, especially if you're living here at the apartments, are probably not going to park on the other side. So we treated them for parking reasons as if it was, excuse me, two separate uh, projects. So we took this half by itself, looked at the commercial, the residential, looked at visitor parking, um, did all our accounts, and we're adequate, but we don't, we don't have extra. Um, one of our concerns is that that building is designed for an older tenant. Our thought process is if that older tenant has guests, there's a good chance it's going to be another older tenant. I don't want people parking where they've got to walk a long distance, and I really want those four spaces, no matter who they're for, dedicated to that building uh, during the day. So we really strongly feel we do not want to lose those four parking spots in front of that building. And in our mind, when you look at, we're fine with compromising if what you're gaining is equal to or greater than what you're losing. And in this case, I feel what we're losing is much, much greater than what we're gaining. Whether that building is 16 feet off that property line, only in one corner. We're about 25 feet off on the corner closest to Route 1. If we were to pull that building nine feet further away, is that really going to gain anything? I, we are on the back side of, uh, you got to remember this, and I'm not trying to minimize uh, the neighbor's concern, but their living structure is very close to Route 1, so we are about 250 feet uh, from the from that back corner where it's close. Um, this is a zone where this is allowed. We are within the allowed setback. Um, we've gone, we've now been in this process, Jay, what, 18 months now? <laughs> that we've had that building in that spot. So I feel like we've come a long, long way. Um, and I will say, I made a lot, a lot of attempts to talk with the neighbor. Um, and I was, it was a little, tough to reach that person and I was not called back until the, the day after all the trees disappeared and finally got a phone call. Um, actually during the site walk I thought the neighbor was pretty, um, he was pretty much in favor of everything. He, absolutely, he has made it clear to me that he is much in favor of the project. He is not thrilled about that size building being right there. Um, and I've, I, I don't know how to politely say, no, we're not going to do a lot. Let me ask you this then. I'm looking at on L301, <coughs> and I'm looking at the, um, the, um, the trees and everything you have planned for right along the back there. Yes. And it, if I'm not mistaken, it looks like the highest tree is about 10 feet tall, which is a river birch. Yeah, would you like which me to is, go through that quickly? Well, I, I'm just wondering, is, is there anything else you can come up with that will create more of a buffer. Well, uh, actually, there is. There, there is a uh, there are clumps of river birch, but in between those, where you see the green markings, those are actually Norway spruce. In in one in two cases, three cases, and in the other case, it's uh, it's a uh, arborvitae. It will grow at least 12, 14 feet. Um, so, in fact, those will be uh, very dense. Uh, Within five years, that'll be, you won't see through it. You'll get glimpses through the river. And then within 10, 12 years, 
you probably won't see the second story. Okay, this is going to be about a 30 plus foot high building, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. about 30 feet at the uh, <coughs> Okay. Let's see. I think that's all I have. That would be a fully mature tree, though, as, as we do see it, 30 to 40 feet yeah. to the tree that's been around for 40, 50 years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm all set. Okay. Thanks. <coughs> Did you have something else, Rachel? Yeah. Um, as I was looking at the plans um, with the townhouses, I've got one option on the side that doesn't include the trellis that um, you might want to explore and I don't know if it would meet the needs of, of the folks here on the planning board but it might be possible to break up that side with a piece of I'm assuming it's final siding yes okay with a piece of trim across um, to the roof the roof line of the porch matching the roof line of the porch yep. if you look at it a lighter siding on the top, a slightly darker siding on the bottom, and that breaks up that whole wall. And then you can, on the front of the building, carry that through by putting a lighter siding just above the porch, and the darker siding, slightly darker siding on the rest. I don't, I don't know if that would be adequate to break up with that sort of an architectural detail, but it would change the color and it would add that little bit of extra architectural detail with that trim line. Yeah, we can look at that. Yeah. And you have to side it anyway, so. Yeah, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks, Rachel. And I'll actually pick up on that, and that, that was along the lines of something I was going to throw out there that, you know, it, it, in some of our commercial zones where we have, where the ordinance calls, the design standards call for sort of breaking up long horizontal planes, that's often been accomplished through fairly subtle changes in material and banding and obviously you don't want to get into anything that's too kind of gimmicky or costly and we're sensitive to that but I would think there might be you know without trying to you know do a design charrette right now I mean I, I, I would think there might be some different approaches you could take that wouldn't necessarily add significant costs that would add a little bit of interest and in addition to the concerns that Mr. McGee raised um, it, it occurs to me that you know, this is ultimately going to be the responsibility of an association to maintain everything. And while that ivy will, I'm sure, will, it'll grow like gangbusters and the cedar will age and that'll be great up to an extent and eventually somebody's going to have to maintain it and, and, and trim it. Um, and obviously with any project, we kind of take a little bit of a leap of faith. Any of these residential projects with our associations, we're taking a little bit of a leap of faith that there will be an association that will maintain those sorts of things but if there's a way to accomplish to sort of address this issue without creating another kind of common area amenity so to speak that has to be maintained over the long term that might be something that's beneficial and okay. maybe and so just you know something to consider um, otherwise I'm I'm generally generally happy with things you know I the, my fellow board members have pretty much raised most of the questions I'd had and have made some other good comments. Um, just looking back over the notes here to make sure I'm not missing anything. We've talked about the zoning zoning compliance items that the staff mentioned. Um, you know, again, as Mr. McGee said, uh, to the extent that you've got to take a couple feet off of something, you know, maybe take it off that back edge of the, the large apartment building. On that topic, um, you know, I hear exactly what you're saying about you know you're you're within the you're within the setback requirements. Um, I was out there on the site walk as well. I found it, you know, it was it was very impactful walking around and sort of seeing that and and empathizing to an extent with the neighbor. But at the same time, you are within that setback, and it's encouraging to hear that there's going to be some pretty ambitious landscaping there that'll that'll grow up and will provide some screening year round. Um, and I appreciate your 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 comments on the parking as well. And in addition to the functional considerations, it's also you know on street parking with projects like this in Eastern Village. Well, that's always part of that whole kind of village you know, concept. And I I appreciate that as well. Um, one comment, just out of curiosity, it, it occurred to me when I was we were out at the site walk that 
there might be, it was sort of implied by the way that the grass had been mowed and some things are being maintained there that there might be a bit of an encroachment onto your property. Is that there, something that there has start? right right now his yes his lawn did his usable lawn was on my property and his shed I believe is over the setback and right okay and that sort of thing <laughs> sometimes happens over time but yeah and and we if we've known that for a few years but obviously it's never. It, There'd be no, there was never a reason why we ever had to have an issue with it. Um, right. So. Okay. Um, just looking back again. Yeah. No, I think we've we've covered things pretty thoroughly here, and we'll look forward to seeing the next iteration. And as we talked about before, hopefully moving this forward next time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have a staff report? Um, I don't have anything to report on. Angela, do you have anything? Um, nope. Oh, I guess um, I think last time I mentioned we were in the process uh, of um, interviewing um, applicants or um, uh, outfits for a comprehensive plan update. I do want to make mention that we have um, come to an agreement and selected a, a, um, a qualified outfit to be assisting the community. So we're sort of finalizing the details of that. And in the coming months, year or so, <laughs> we'll be uh, working with those folks so the board will get to know them. The outfit is TPUDC. I think I got that right. Town Planning Urban Development Collaborative. I feel like I'm getting the C wrong. But uh, anyway. Um, we had four really qualified outfits that we were comfortable with and um, ultimately felt that this outfit was going to be the best fit and we're, we're excited to get that process going. So, um, Great. I hadn't cool. mentioned that before. We'll look forward to there that. That'll be, a, be an interesting time to be on the board. Um, any correspondence to report? Oh, sorry. Do we have an administrative amendment report? I don't believe we have anything to report. This go around? I think there was something that went back and forth, but it's sort of over the holidays, so I don't know whether that actually if there was, forward. I will be sure I will okay. do more due diligence on that and report it next time. All right. I apologize for that. All right. Uh, any correspondence? No? Any planning board comments? Congratulations to the chair and the Good job. Thank you. Congratulations. Don't get secretary. Vice President. <laughs> secretary, sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to be sick. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I think the board will be in good hands. I, I, have, uh, I have one of those questions that a newbie can ask. Sure. Uh, and under the traffic reports, um, traffic impact, it was showing for the proposed Dunstan Village impact fee, it showed no impact on Payne Road, uh, the Payne Road intersection. I was wondering why. So yeah, so when the traffic engineers do their, their magic, <laughs> they essentially, the way we assign, I'll start with the way we assign traffic impact fees is the amount of trips generated out of a project during the PM peak hour. So it's not all their trips at all times. Mm -hmm. It's during that critical PM peak hour when those intersections are failing. So it's the Payne Road area, Oak Hill, Hygis, and Dunstan. Um, we've done some repair. Anyway, I'll, that's, I don't need to get into all the history. So, um, so what they do is they take the, let's call it 20 trips that will be coming out of uh, Dunstan Village at the PM peak hour, and they assign those. How they do that exactly, they have a model that says, 12 people are going to take a left turn, 8 people are going to take a right turn. Then they send them to the next intersection, the Old Blue Point Road. Oh, two people veer off at Old Blue Point Road. That leaves us with 10 that get to Dunstan. Okay, so on those 10 trips, well, one person takes a right at Pine Point, one person goes up broad turn, you send them down. And so that's, so yes, there's, Obviously, there's no model that can account for what human behavior is going to do, but I believe what they're really looking at is what's traffic doing in general, 
you know, if 80% of the trips are taken are heading south at that time, well, then likely 80% of the people coming out are going to want to head south. So, I mean, there is some science behind it, but there is also some art. So, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a little black box inside which some determinations mm -hmm. are made. That is how it is right. done, and Thank we you. yes. <laughs> I have a question also, somewhat of a newbie question. So I would very much like to see the lighting plan for that intersection on the last project. Mm -hmm. not, I'm not talking specific to that project, so I know we're not supposed to talk about it after they leave, but how do you ask, you know, do you formally ask for something like that? or do yep. I mentioned it, and I'm hoping that, you know, in good faith they'll bring it back next time, but if they don't, is there a formal process to No, I would say if there's something specific a board member wants, explicitly ask for it. Um, that issue was raised in Bill Bray's memo. So what we typically expect to see when an applicant comes back to the board is a response to staff comments. So what you should see in the next time is when, when they're doing a really bang up job, they, they uh, put the staff comment and then their answer underneath it. Staff comment, answer underneath it. Sometimes we'll just get the answers and you have to pull out the old report. <laughs> but, but hopefully where that's in uh, Bill Bray's memo as our peer reviewer saying, hey, as part of this detailing and you chose the lighting, that we'll see it. So okay. um, it's my expectation we'd see that as well. All right. I just didn't know if there was a... Yeah, I, I, would say, I would say moving forward, future, future deliberations, you want... There's something that's sort of vaguely in staff comments. Feel free to just say... Mr. Developer, I want to see this, or okay. Mrs. Developer, or okay. whatever the case may be. And I would say, too, that if there's something that occurs to you outside of the meeting as you're reviewing the materials or thinking about them that you'd like to see, you can email Jay, mm -hmm. and he'll make sure that everybody on the board, oh, uh, okay. that, that he'll, he makes the re he'll make the request to the applicant and then make sure everyone gets it. Okay. And if I send you something stupid, Jay, you'll send me back an email saying, Rick, that's really stupid. <laughs> 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 we'll just keep that between us. Yeah, we'll keep that between us. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Any other board comments? All right. I will move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you. Who's playing football tonight? Anyone know?